All right, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for, for being here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about quantum mechanics. So it's a fairly difficult uh, subject, both practically and conceptually. Hopefully, we can uh, cover quite a bit of it today, though. Um, as is usual, I, bought a, I brought a bag of tricks. Quantum mechanics deals with things that are really small, so my bag of tricks is small today. And uh, we'll see how these can help us understand this topic. So why quantum? Why did quantum mechanics arise? Um, there was, as we discussed in the topic about measuring the universe, and we also discussed this in the lives of stars, there are different characteristic colors that each element has when it's heated up enough that the electrons in the element uh, start jumping around. They only jump around in very discrete ways. Another word for discrete is quantized or quantum. So one of the first indications that quantum phenomena was relevant to nature were these discrete lines in, uh, in, in spectra of elements. There was this fellow back in the 1800s who spent a great deal of time. He published something like 5,000 uh, words, 5,000 lines of text over six volumes characterizing this spectrum of different elements. But back when they did this, they had no explanation for why different elements had different characteristic colors or spectrums. Um, it was simply a matter of categorizing. And one of the things that I think is really relevant to understanding science is that many times science begins with the simple act of categorization. We can see that one thing is different than another. And that simple act of categorization leads to being able to put things into uh, different buckets. So he came up with many different buckets to characterize atoms and to characterize their spectrum. And uh, th again, there was no explanation for this. It's similar to how, um, was it Linnaeus? The Linnean Society uh, came up with uh, taxonomy and uh, how you can split uh, animals into different categories. Is that is that right? Yeah, it's Linnean, right? <coughs> and, um, and then there's this other thing called the ultraviolet catastrophe. So classical physics, especially since James Clerk Maxwell, felt that they had a pretty good handle on the way that light, or electromagnetic radiation, works in the universe. And one of the predictions that they had was this equation that described how much energy should be emitted from a hot object given a certain temperature. And when they, when they ran this equation um, on their pieces of paper and they calculated it, they found that it predicted that an almost infinite amount of energy would be associated with a relatively hot um, uh, radiative source. But what they measured was something distinctly different than that. It peaked at a certain color and then uh, fell off rapidly. And they had no theoretical or mathematical framework for understanding why that might be. So this was called the ultraviolet catastrophe because it projected that the shorter the wavelength, the more energy was emitted in that wavelength. And there was this fellow who came along in uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s, Max Planck, you may have heard of him. And he, uh, he decided that that ultraviolet catastrophe problem could be remedied if you assume that light was emitted in discrete quanta or quantums rather than in a continuous spectrum. And when he used this idea to rewrite the equation for how much energy gets emitted by a radiative body, it turns out that it fit perfectly with what experimentalists had found. And so this guy got one of these, a Nobel Prize. And uh, this is going to be the first of many Nobel Prizes. It was a rip-roaring wonderful time to be alive back in the 1920s and 1930s. Nearly every Nobel Prize in physics that was awarded was related to quantum mechanics. So the other problem related to why quantum mechanics was relevant is, uh, is pertaining to atomic stability. So one of the basic ideas from classical physics, from Maxwell's equations, is that whenever you have a charged particle accelerating, it emits light. It loses energy because it's accelerating. Well, one of the ways something can accelerate is to move along a curved path. 
It doesn't have to necessarily be changing the magnitude of its speed. It can instead just be changing direction. And this phenomena is used all the time. There's a, uh, at Argonne National Labs, there's this particle accelerator which has as its main outcome or main function uh, generating high intensity, I believe it's x-rays, because the electrons are moving around very rapidly in a tight circle in a device they have there that's kind of like a mini Fermi lab. So you can take advantage of the fact that moving charges just by moving them in a, in a curved path causes them to emit radiation. Interestingly enough, people had pretty good uh, ideas about electrons orbiting the nucleus of an atom. And if it's orbiting the atom, well, why doesn't it emit radiation constantly? And why doesn't the electrons spiral in and fall into the, the core of the atom? Why doesn't the atom always emit light? Nobody had a practical explanation for why that was the case. It was a head scratcher. Well, this idea of quantum mechanics um, led Louis de Broglie, who was a French aristocrat and um, spent much of his uh, time doing physics on the side, he said, well, if light can have wave-like properties and those wave-like properties come in discrete or quantized bits, then why can't electrons also have quantized or wave-like properties? So he also won a Nobel Prize for postulating that. And what he ended up saying was that if an electron has an associated wavelength, then you can only fit certain orbits around a nucleus of an atom. You see how up here the, uh, the wave doesn't quite match itself? It doesn't constitute what's called a standing wave. The only allowed orbits for electrons around atoms are ones that have the electron wavelength constituting a standing wave, so it overlaps itself. So that was a way that you could apply this notion of quantization of wavelength-related phenomena to the behavior of an atom, and that explained atomic stability. Here's an example of how the wavelengths overlap and form a consistent pattern. Here's one where they don't overlap. This is not allowed by nature. Here's an example of what this um, version of the atom, this view of the atom, might have looked like. You have different orbitals of electrons having different standing wave patterns. And here's some quantum numbers. You may remember, if you took uh, chemistry, there's the P shell and the S shell, and a certain number of electrons can fit in each of them. This was the beginning of that kind of thinking. This kind of thinking leads to our modern conception of the way that electron orbitals geometrically are, or rather, probabilistically are configured around an atomic nucleus. There are certain atoms that have very stable spherical shells. There are other atoms that have very complex shapes for the probabilities of finding electrons around the <coughs> nucleus. And this uh, leads to all the things that you've talked about in chemistry. You learned about the S shell, the S, P, D, and F shells, and the number of electrons that can go into each shell. I'm not going to talk about it in in great detail except to point out that this notion of the quantization of a wave-like particle of an electron leads directly to this view of the way atoms really work. You can even construct a view of the periodic table using these kinds of constructs. And you see that there are different characteristic shapes along the columns of the periodic table. That explains why, or this is one of the, one of the things that derives from this, is the fact that atoms of different elements in the same column, because they have similar shapes to their electron clouds, they also have similar chemical behaviors, and in many cases, they're interchangeable. And then comes this guy, who also won a Nobel Prize. Uh, looks like there. And uh, what uh, this is Niels Bohr. Uh, he had a famous conceptual discussion and debate uh, with Albert Einstein. And uh, he, he believed that the reason that atomic spectra, remember we talked about that a couple minutes ago? The reason that atomic spectra have characteristic or discrete lines is because what happens is an electron will jump from one of those orbitals that we saw on the previous page to a lower energy or a lower configuration orbital. And it always jumps in this quantized way. It doesn't, an electron from this shell won't end up in here. It'll always 
either be here or there. And when it transitions from a higher to a lower shell, it emits a photon or a piece of light of a very characteristic and universal color for that particular element with that particular transition. That's why when we look at galaxies that are far away, we can tell what they're made of because atoms of hydrogen four billion light years away behave the same as atoms of hydrogen here on Earth. And we know that and we can measure the color of light. So Niels Bohr won a Nobel Prize for understanding and characterizing the way that these atomic transitions happen in the context of atoms. There's this notion, however, now we've talked a lot about if you treat an electron as a wave, if you treat a photon as a wave, you can get a lot of these quantum phenomena explained as long as the waves come in uh, 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 fairly quantized packets. Well, along comes an upstart in 1905 who looks at another unexplained phenomena called the photoelectric effect. And there's this weird idea, if you shine a flashlight on a metal plate, it will eject some electrons. It will cause a little current. We can take advantage of this phenomenon whenever we make soda, photosynthesis or whenever we make detectors in digital cameras. So what happens is the light comes in, it ejects some, le some electrons. If the light comes in, and let's say it's infrared light instead of visible light, what typically happens is it doesn't generate any electrons at all. If you have light coming in of a lower frequency, so the light individual photons have less energy, then it may eject the same electrons, but the electrons are ejected with a much lower velocity. So these are the same electrons. Here they're ejected with a high velocity. Here they're ejected with a low velocity. You can also change the intensity of the light. If you change the intensity of the light, the velocity with which the electrons are ejected does not increase. You're shining a brighter and brighter light, but the current that you get out of this metal plate doesn't, um, uh, doesn't change in terms of the velocity, the speed of the electrons. What does change is the number of electrons ejected. So the idea is that if you match some property of the electrons with some property of the light, you get electrons ejected. If you, wear, if you instead use low frequency light, it never couples to or interacts with the electrons in the plate. So how can that be? If, if light is a wave, shouldn't this low frequency light be giving some of the electrons just a tiny amount of energy so that you get a tiny bit of current? Well, that's not what we see. We see that in order to get any current at all, you have to increase the frequency of light to some minimum value. And there's a fellow who looked at this phenomena in 1905 and said the only way that this can be explained as a phenomena of nature is to assume that light comes in particles that have a particular energy. If a light particle of low energy interacts with an electron, that particular light particle doesn't have enough energy to move that particular electron. In order to move that electron in a metal plate, you have to have a light particle with enough energy to move the electron. This is a very discrete view of the way electrons and light interact, and it's much different than a standard view of waves coming along and sloshing along all of the electrons. So this was fairly de definitive evidence that light came in individual particles. It, was, it exhibited characteristics consistent with individual particles. This is contrary to everything that had been believed since Isaac Newton. And so since this guy overturned a theory that had held since Isaac Newton, he also got one of these, a Nobel Prize. Interestingly enough, Albert Einstein got his Nobel Prize not for the theory of relativity, which we discussed a week or so ago, or a month or so ago, but rather for the photoelectric effect. And then comes um, a, a wonderfully intelligent fellow from Germany named uh, Erwin Schrödinger. And Schrödinger um, devised this uh, differential equation. Uh, this is just a mathematical operator like a multiplication sign or a division sign. It's a little, a little more um, complex than that, but it's just a mathematical operator. This is the constant, this is the same constant that Planck discovered when he figured out black body radiation. 
This is the mass of your particle, maybe an electron. <coughs> and then there's a mathematical operator on this function. And then there's the potential energy associated with the system you're measuring, associated with this same function. And then the rate of change of this function divided over time, so the change in the function over time multiplied by, you see this imaginary number here? Isn't that interesting? Remember we started talking about imaginary numbers uh, a few weeks ago? Well, here's an equation where an imaginary value comes out of the process. This function that I'm alluding to, it looks like a little uh, pitchfork, this function is called the wave function. So for any system that's quantum mechanical, whether it's an electron or a photon, this is an equation that can describe um, how this wave function might change in space when subjected to any particular potential energy, like an electric field or, uh, some, or magnetic field, some other kind of interaction that causes a, a change in the potential. So, uh, Erwin Schrodinger um, came up with that equation. He also got one of these shiny gold things. So you're seeing a pattern here. Amazing number of discoveries providing deeper and deeper insights into the way quantum mechanics works. Rather than just de Broglie, the French fellow, rather than just de Broglie's view that you just have to have some kind of wave function that constitutes a standing wave, he came up and he described how that wave should respond to different potential fields. And he got a Nobel Prize for that. So let's talk about where quantum mechanics is relevant. It's relevant in terms of the small. In terms of mass, atoms are to humans as humans are to, in terms of mass, you, you weigh as much compared to an atom as, um, or an atom weighs as much compared to you as you do compared to, what, a boulder, a mountain? Universe. The universe, that's a good guess, it's actually the Earth. Um, so I, it must not show up until later, but uh, R to Earth. So the ratio between your mass and the mass of the planet Earth is about the same as the ratio between the mass of a typical atom and your mass. Atoms are incredibly tiny things in terms of their mass. Also, there are more atoms in a human being then there are stars in the observable universe. So the, the atoms are incredibly tiny geometrically. They have an incredibly tiny mass. And when we talk about quantum mechanics, we must necessarily talk about things that affect um, these very tiny parts of nature. If an atomic nucleus were the size of a baseball, the electron shell would be about two and a half miles distant. All right, so the nucleus of an atom, we're accustomed to thinking about the nucleus of an atom. If it were right there, the electron wouldn't just be a few inches or a few feet away. It would be a mile away. Yeah. How are they seeing that? Um, so they could do scattering experiments. They, they bounce one particle off of an atom and see how often it interacts with a part of that atom. And by, by measuring how often it interacts with the atom and the angle at which the, the projectile is reflected off, they can get a sense of the geometry of the atom they're dealing with. Um, quantum phenomena are relevant, meaning they exhibit the effects uh, of the same scale of the objects in question only when the scale of the elements being assessed is at most 1,000 million million times smaller than what we typically see in our everyday life. This is, the, this is compared to one meter, and a meter is about this far. So quantum phenomena only become relevant on scales that are 1,000 million million times smaller than we typically interact with in our everyday lives. Oh, there's the earth. All right. So, I want to talk a little bit about the act of measurement. One of the ideas that's fairly consistent and it's easy to develop as a human being is that nature is out there and that we come along and we observe nature. All right. 
We can use this whenever we're sending a probe to Jupiter. Jupiter is out there, and we send a probe out to Jupiter, and we measure Jupiter. But when you're dealing with reality, you necessarily interact with it. That probe that we're sending off to Jupiter has a certain mass associated with it. And what that means is that there's an incredibly tiny, in fact, it's so tiny we can't practically measure it. There's a tiny impact on the planet Jupiter because of the gravitational effect of the probe that we're sending to Jupiter. The effect is so small, the change in the motion of Jupiter is probably smaller than the size of an atom. But it's there, nonetheless. But we can forget about it. We can forget about the fact that any time we measure or interact with nature, that we're influencing nature. But in reality, this is the way that we are. And this idea that we are encased in a natural universe, that we are comprised of natural things. We are made of atoms and electrons, just like a beam in a particle accelerator in Fermilab. This notion that you are made of the same stuff as everything else in the universe, and you must necessarily interact with that stuff in order to measure it, is conveyed by this idea that we are an inherent part of nature. I don't want to say we're trapped in nature, because that makes it sound bad, right? It's, uh, we revel in the fact that we inhibit, inhabit, see, I did it again. I had another lecture where I said inhibit, uh, where we inhabit a wonderful universe. So this idea of uncertainty and complementarity, this idea that in order to measure the universe, you must necessarily interact with it, was quantified mathematically in terms of a physical um, measurement by Werner Heisenberg, who lived um, in the first two-thirds of the 20th century. And what he found was that any time you try to measure one of these or one of these other things, the measurement of one will necessarily interfere with the measurement of the other. So if you want to measure position of a thing, you're going to interfere with its momentum. So let's say, for example, that I wanted to measure your location by, um, I, didn't, I didn't fit a basketball in here, but let's say I had a basketball, and I wanted to measure where you were. I could do it by throwing a basketball at you and seeing how that basketball bounced off, right? Well, when that basketball interacts with you, it's going to change your momentum. You're going to have a little bit of recoil from the fact that I'm throwing basketballs at you, right? When we're dealing with things that are as large as a human being or even as large as a butterfly or perhaps even an amoeba, when we're dealing with things that are large like that, this effect of interaction when we're measuring it can largely be ignored. But once you start measuring things that are a thousand million million times smaller than that, you still have to react, you have to interact with these things by means of the available processes that the natural world makes. Electrons, photons, electric fields, magnetic fields. So anytime we're trying to measure something incredibly small with the smallest thing of which nature is comprised, they're going to be on the order of the same scale. And we're going to necessarily disturb those things. So the same thing happens with energy. If you try to measure the energy of a system and the duration uh, that a system persists, uh, the same thing happens for a quantum mechanical property called spin that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And then the value of a field versus the rate of change of a field. And of course, he got one of these things as well. Now, this uncertainty principle idea is a little difficult to conceptualize, so I brought a tangible example. All right. So, <clears throat> we have this uh, object this egg, all right? And let's uh, pretend that we don't have, analogies are sometimes not perfectly consistent, right? You can't necessarily create an analogy that's, that's absolutely accurate to every physical phenomenon. But here's the analogy I'm going to use. 
An egg may have a green yolk. And an egg may have a red spot in its yolk. And an egg may have a double yolk. An egg also has a particular shape. Right? It's got a geometric configuration. So in principle, I can measure the shape of this egg to arbitrary precision. But what that doesn't tell me anything about is how the yolk of the egg is constituted. If I want to measure the yolk of the egg, I have to do this. Right? Well, this is just a standard yellow oak. There's yolk. There's nothing surprising about it. But now it's going to be much, very challenging to put this Humpty Dumpty shell back together again and to extrapolate what the configuration of this shell is. I can either look at the yolk and measure it, or I can measure the geometry of the eggshell. I can't do both. Now, some of you are clever enough to think, well, if I had a high-intensity light, I could potentially shine it through the egg and whatnot. Well, that's where my analogy happens to fail. But if you just trust the the larger idea that you can only measure one thing or the other, and by virtue of measuring one of them, you hide information about the other thing. You can only access one piece of information about this. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's an example of how this uncertainty principle works. Using ideas about wave-particle interactions or duality and the idea that electrons have a certain wavelength, you can do something called the double slit experiment. You can uh, set up, a, uh, you can take a couple of razor blades and put them really close together, and then very near that, you can take a couple other razor blades and put them very close together, and you've created these two little um, uh, very thin slits. If you pass a light beam, like, something like this light beam, right? If you pass this light beam through these double slits, you will find that the light beam um, creates an interference pattern, right? It goes through one uh, the part of the light wave. The wave characteristic of this light beam goes through one slit, and part of it goes through another. And just like water waves on the rip, uh, rippling surface of a pond, you will see an interference pattern on a screen. You can do the same thing with electrons. Now here's one of the weird things about quantum mechanics. If I have a very weak source of electrons or photons, and I emit one particle at a time, and I let it accumulate thousands or millions of blips on a screen resulting from those, then what I will see is that over time I will get an interference pattern but only one particle at a time has been emitted. All right, let's say that there are electrons. I want to do something clever. I put a little magnetic hoop right here around this slit so that if an electron goes through this slit, I will know it unambiguously. I will know that an electron went through here. When I do that, you will just see a blob, no interference lines. So just by virtue of measuring which of those two slits an electron went through, I destroy the interference pattern. I have forced the electron to declare what trajectory it went through. And it has lost its wave-like properties. This is amazing. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. So there's some strangeness. So um, next is uh, uh, Paul Dirac. And um, he, a uh, very esoteric character, there's a wonderful um, <coughs> biography of him called The Strangest Man, which I recommend. Anyway, Paul Dirac comes along and he creates, instead of the Schrodinger equation, remember we talked about relativity and how uh, the way that different physical phenomena exhibit characteristics can be dependent upon the motion of the observer and the fact that the speed of light has to be constant. So he took these ideas of relativity and he baked them into this uh, idea that modifies the Schrodinger equation. And I'm not going to go through details about explaining the equation. Know that he created it and that it includes the same kind of thing like momentum, speed of light. Here's Planck's constant again. And what he found by virtue of this equation 
was that there are some really strange things that happen in the quantum world. You see this I is showing up again, right? Remember when we talked about mathematics, one of the things we covered how if you multiply I times I, then you got negative 1. You remember that? What happens if you multiply I times I and then times I times I? That's negative 1 times negative 1. So you have to multiply I by itself four times to get back to 1. And 1 times anything is the thing itself. So what this notion entailed was this idea that if you operated on a wave function in a manner such that um, you tried to, to, to rotate it once, you go from i, and now you multiply it by i again. So that's a complete rotation, is i times i worth of um, interaction or, or explanation of this wave function rotated in space. Well, i times i is negative 1. Well, negative 1 times a thing isn't the same as a thing. Negative 1 times me is a negative me. In order to completely describe the, the, the way to transform a wave function back to 1 times itself instead of negative 1 times itself, you had to rotate it not in one complete circle, but you had to rotate it in two complete circles. And this is mind-blowing. This is something in nature where you have to rotate it by 720 degrees to get it back to where it started. And this doesn't make any sense. Yes? Is this particle spin? Yes, this is particle spin. So out of this notion of the fact that you could have um, a spin that's either positive or negative, and you had to operate on it twice to get it to go all the way around, you had to make it go through 720 degrees, this is where you get derivative things like the Pauli exclusion principle, uh, which says that you can only have two electrons with opposite spin in the same <coughs> orbital of an atom. Now, it's pretty complicated. I don't necessarily intend to go into details, except to show that just by virtue of incorporating relativity into a modified version of Schrodinger's idea for a wave equation, he was able to predict that electron spin was an inherent part of being able to count the way atoms can arrange their electrons. There's another outcome of his prediction. Uh, oh, he got a, one of these for the Nobel Prize for that as well. One of the other outcomes of that, uh, so we've got spin. I talked about that. Here's a cosmic ray that comes in from space. This is a picture in something called a cloud chamber, where the charged particles cause condensation of droplets. So a cosmic ray comes in here. It hits something, maybe uh, another atom or something. And then it causes an electron to be spewed off, and then also a positron. So it creates a pair, an electron-positron pair, and they have opposite charges. So one of the things that Dirac's equation predicted was um, antimatter. He predicted that there would be such a thing as a positron, an anti-electron, before it had ever been observed in nature. And he turned out, it turned out he was right, and that's why he got the Nobel Prize. Um, it also talks about uh, the quantum mechanics has to do with the importance of observation. Remember, in order to measure or interact with a system, you have to uh, necessarily disturb it because you're a part of the universe. You've got atoms and electrons, and any device you try to interact with an atom with, you've got electrons and protons and light waves that impact your eye and your finger or any microscope uses light, or maybe an electron microscope uses electrons. No matter what, when you try to measure nature, you are using some ability that nature has to provide an interaction force, and you're exploiting that at the tiniest scale that nature allows. So you're going to find some strange things. This notion that observation was important led Einstein to say something like, well, does the moon exist when we're not looking at it, if observation is important? It also led people to say that consciousness is important because, well, what does it mean to observe something? 
Does observation necessarily entail a conscious being interacting with the world and making some decision about it? And philosophers debated this for quite some time. This is no longer under debate. The answer about whether the moon exists if we don't look at it is now known to be yes. <laughs> That arises from something called decoherence. So what they, what scientists have come up with is this idea that any macroscopic system that interacts with a very controlled, very tiny quantum system, any macroscopic system that will interact with that, will necessarily smear out the quantum phenomena, and it will cause something that they call decoherence. So it doesn't take a conscious observer. It doesn't take a human being or an alien from Proxima Centauri to interact with a system to destroy some of the quantum strangeness. All it takes is a macroscopic system trying to couple with a very delicately balanced quantum system. And the only way you can exhibit many of these quantum strange phenomena is to have one of these incredibly contrived, delicately balanced, tiny systems. Nature doesn't tend to deal with those individually, we have to contrive a circumstance that makes it arise. So th there's an idea that whenever you're looking at a phenomena, the probability, that wave function, by the way, the Schrodinger wave function and the, the Dirac wave function, describe not a water wave or a light wave, but a, a kind of probability wave. One of the ways you can interpret that is to say that whenever you measure a system, so let's think about probability for a second. Whenever you measure something that has a probability, like whether you're going to win the lottery or not, let's say you've got a lottery ticket. You know that the probability is 1 in 100 million that you're going to win the lottery. But let's say you do win the lottery. Well, then the probability that your ticket uh, is the right one is 100%. How can the probability change from 1 in, the, in 100 million to, to 1? So probabilities have to do with anticipatory measurements. Once you've measured something, it's no longer relevant to talk about the probability of the system. So quantum mechanics talks about the, probab the probability of something. It says once you try to measure it, here's the chances that you're going to find a certain value. But once you've found that value, <coughs> probability is no longer relevant. you found that value with 100% certainty. <coughs> So the, I, one of the ideas is that you can create a coupled system, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second, where if you measure one part of it, well, let me just do it right now. So I've got this system. The system comprises a coin, all right? And you know how coins are configured, all right? I, I do this, and I have it heads. You can tell me with 100% certainty, assuming that this is just a regular coin, what the other side of this is, even though I haven't measured it, right? You can tell me that this is a tails. Well, let's say that instead of a coin, I had a rod that's a, a light year long, and I spin that rod. If you stop one end of that rod, and let's say I paint one end blue and the other end red, or I can call them heads and tails, keep it consistent. You stop one end of the rod, and it's got heads on it. Well, even though the other end is a light year away, what do you know about it? It's a tails. So quantum mechanics allows you to generate systems that are comprised of a couple of, of particles. You can generate uh, pairs of electrons or pairs of photons that, are, uh, that have uh, properties that are perfectly correlated, such that if you measure one, you necessarily know the state of the other one. And one of the ways that you can envision this is that as soon as you measure one electron, one piece of that, the wave function collapses. The wave function describing probability collapses. Another way to look at it is the notion of non-locality, where when you do something over here, the impact of that is instantaneously transmitted somewhere else. Not at the speed of light, not subject to Einstein's provision that you can never uh, convey something faster than light, but instantaneously. And I have an experiment of that I'll show you. So I brought these little polarizers. 
And these polarizers have an interesting characteristic. I'm going to pass these out. Uh, you can uh, hold on to them, and then uh, I'll keep three for myself. You need three to do this experiment. So I've got three here. So a polarizer filters out light. I'm going to go over here by the screen. Maybe you can see it a little more clearly. All right. Uh, where is it? There it is. All right. A polarizer filters out light. Okay. And if the polarizers are aligned with each other, then all of the light gets through. You see that? Now, what happens if I turn them 90 degrees to each other? These aren't perfectly uh, wonderful polarizers. They're relatively inexpensive. Edison you can't see. Yeah. Sorry. If I turn them that way, they block out the light. You see that? So if they're aligned, you get all the light. If they're not aligned, it blocks out most of most of the light. All right, you see that? Now, here's where the trick comes in. What are you aligning? Uh, the, it's, it's the, think of it as the grain of the polarizer without getting into great detail. All right, so there's a way I can align them where it cuts out almost all the light. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a third polarizer and I'm going to put it in here. And you see that that allows more light through. You would think that putting another dark filter in between here might cut out even more of the light, but instead it lets more light through. You see that? Yeah. And as I rotate it to be consistent with one of the others, then of course it blocks the light. So how is that? Well, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics both have an explanation for that. But here's where it gets strange. I can create two photons that have perfectly correlated polarization values. And I can set up two polarizers on Alpha Centauri. And I can keep a pair of polarizers here. And because these photons are created at exactly the same instant and they have exactly correlated polarizations, when that one of those photons is measured to have a particular orientation with regards to two polarizers here. Two polarizers on Alpha Centauri will be impacted by how I choose to have these polarizations align with respect to each other. Right? We can talk a little bit more about this at lunch if you wish, um, because I don't have a lot of time today. But for now, just take it as the way I choose to configure my experiment here on planet Earth will impact the measurements they make on Alpha Centauri. And interestingly enough, the measurements will be impacted instantaneously. And they've done this in laboratories. They haven't done it over a light year, but they've done it over several meters. So you might ask, does this allow the transmission of messages faster than the speed of light? The answer is no. Because in order to recognize that that had an immediate impact at Alpha Centauri, you have to bring the record of what happened at Alpha Centauri and the record of what I did here together and compare them. So you can't just look at the record in Alpha Centauri and say, oh, look, Scott changed his polarizers by 20 degrees. You can't tell that. But when you bring the record together and you look at the way that the measurements are correlated with one another, you'll see that as soon as I, on Earth, change this by 20 degrees, it changed the correlation pattern between them. Yes? You can't tell that on Earth, that, you, that something happened at Alpha Centauri. Right, you have to go check it. You have to get it. You Alpha Centauri that something happened on Earth instantaneously. No. Oh, the, the only, only way, way you can, can uncover that something happened is to compare the results. Okay. okay. Uh, another potential explanation for this, rather than instantaneous communication, um, is you've got an idea of pilot <coughs> waves. So um, some physicists came up with this notion that there is some some phenomena that conveys physical information that goes ahead of particles or goes ahead of photons and tells them what slit to choose in the double slit experiment. And then one of the most exciting 
interpretations is this many worlds idea where you can potentially have um, every time a quantum element makes, makes a choice, it creates a whole new universe with that choice and then the other universe with the separate choice. So that you could have many worlds, many universes, parallel universes <coughs> resulting from quantum mechanics. Now which of these is accurate? Nobody knows. Maybe there's a new idea that nobody's thought of that explains how what, what happens here can instantly affect what happens at Alpha Centauri. This idea of entanglement, however, where one photon and another photon are intimately related, is used in things like quantum cryptography. So that if something happens at you, you receive a message, then that same thing will happen at another person who is trying to decode the message. And it's a foolproof way to do encryption in principle. But remember that correlation is not causation. This is one of the, the, the common statements that's bandied about in my household. Just because something is correlated doesn't mean that it's causal. So you can't convey information just with correlation. So let's spend a couple minutes talking about quantum nonsense. This is a wonderful book, 10 Quantum Tools to Change Your World in an Instant. This book can permanently enhance your vibrational state, <laughs> making the impossible probable. <laughs> so it uses some of the language from quantum mechanics, your vibrational state, probability. Can we see what this says? The law of attraction, magnetic money magic, <laughs> and other cool tricks you need to know. People have co-opted the language of quantum mechanics and this somewhat outdated notion that an intelligent observer needs to be involved in quantum mechanics. They've co-opted this without necessarily going through the rigors of studying the science. They've used the vocabulary to convey nonsense. Uh, Amazon. <laughs> Very interesting now, by the way. Yeah. Uh, create more abundance. Uh, so the title, Why Quantum Physicists Create More Abundance. <laughs> There's a whole series of books with the, uh, with the title, Why Quantum Physicists, XXX. Why Quantum Physicists Have More Dates. Why Quantum Physicists Create More Abundance. Why Quantum Physicists Are exorbitantly wealthy, I guess. Then we have a couple here. How are you guys doing? <laughs> right, so the idea is that quantum mechanics can be co-opted, the vocabulary can be co-opted for nonsense, and you have to be aware of this. When you talk about my vibrational energy, my quantum state, that you have to measure me to know how I really feel, remember, the realm at which quantum mechanics is relevant is a millionth of a millionth of the size of anything we typically re interact with in our day-to-day -day lives. And the systems that quantum mechanics is relevant to must be delicately balanced on something smaller than a knife edge between quantum states. It has nothing to do with your preferences about money, your dreams about the future, or your love life. <laughs> yes? You mean the article I saw about how quantum physics proves that our souls go to a parallel universe after we die was not true? <laughs> uh, sorry to say, it was not true. Yeah. What else do we have here? Oh, wow, you can read this for yourself. Yeah. I got a question. When you were talking about the size of a baseball compared to electrons two and a half miles away, is it possible that that space is dark matter like it is in I don't know. Are there any theories about that? I don't know for certain. I know that some theories of dark matter propose things called WMAP, uh, WIMPs, weak back interactive massing particles, and other things that uh, if, they, if dark matter is a type of microscopic particle, submicroscopic particle, then maybe these particles move uh, between atoms. Um, I don't know. I don't know what their wavelength would be. I don't know what their mass would be. I don't know if it would be 
larger than the scale. If they're massive, then the wavelength would be larger or smaller than an atom. I, I, I don't know. I don't think dark matter is, nobody has a quantum theory of dark matter as far as I know. Nobody even knows what it is enough to speculate, much less measure. Um, why quantum <laughs> physicists don't get fat? <laughs> you can buy this book. <laughs> Your quantum breakthrough quote, the simple technique that brings everlasting joy and success. Complete BS. Uh, New York Times bestseller, notice that. Right? One of the reasons people use this language is because it seems scientific, it seems mystical, it seems magical. It's baloney. Quantum faith. How does quantum physics relate to the Bible? Can words move mountains? How did Jesus supersede the laws of physics? <laughs> Nonsense. I haven't read it. I didn't want to spend my money on it. Quantum dishwasher detergent. <laughs> Get it sub microscopically clean. I don't know. Duracell quantum batteries. And then my favorite, Deepak Chopra. <laughs> oh my goodness, talk about a walking ball of nonsense. <laughs> so, he uses quantum to mean a new state of being. He doesn't use quantum typically to mean anything like we've talked about today. And if you restrict his meaning of quantum to be a new state of being, a jump from one level of existence to another, it's not as offensive, but if you read the rest of his words, <laughs> it, it gets it's pretty ridiculous. I once read a book as a child. I wasn't able to find an example. I wasn't able to find it in my bookshelf. I almost never throw away a book. But I read a book as a child that stipulated the following. The reason quantum mechanics is weird and that we can't predict what happens until we measure it is because God is controlling every quantum phenomena intentionally. And the way he does this is he puts an angel on every electron. <laughs> every electron in the universe has an angel on it that stipulates how it will behave when subjected to a particular experiment. Baloney. That's how the flying spaghetti monster works. Right. <laughs> All right, that's, that's it. it. Uh, so, thank you very much.